Oh, 35 minutes? Okay. I'm going to go through this. We already talked about MRI. Use a good one, okay? You got this, even though this was the sports series, you go. This McLaren is probably a little bit better. Uh, your patients are going to pay the exact same for an MRI. MRI, MRI is billed as an MRI is billed as MRI. Uh, use the good ones, okay? They're going to get a lot more information from a three Tesla, okay? So I don't own one, all right, but I use them. Uh, when I use them, I like to use a three T. Uh, better signal noise ratio, right, higher les resolution, contrast. They're faster, the patient spends less time in there, and overall they're much better. Specific uses, if they have a um, uh, hip replacement or joint replacement or artifact, then you may want to use lower field strength. And again, this inflammation and edema is important. If they're claustrophobic, this is, these are the new scanners. You can see how much room there is in this one. This used to be the old one, all right, and this is an open. So it's a, much less uh, claustrophobic. This is an upright scanner. Uh, there is one in Seattle now. They used to be, Epic used to have one. It was okay. It was just very cumbersome um, to use. And just one example of, uh, this is a patient, 67-year-old female, chronic right hip pain, low back pain, buttock pain, evaluated by uh, lumbar MRI, and they thought it was her facets because they were inflamed. She came to us, second opinion, it was the clinical examination, had severe hip issues as well. This was the lumbar spine, had a little bit of a herniated disc, and had facet effusions. We talked about that. The other thing she had, though, when we examined her, we said that her hip seems to be where this is coming from. We scanned her hip. Again, fluid is bad in musculoskeletal. These are, this is the gluteus medius insertion at the greater trochanter. Look how bright that is here. It's a partial tear, severe uh, bursitis. The other thing that was going on, this is a sagittal view of her hip joint, because she had intraarticular hip type pain. She has full thickness cartilage loss. All of this here, that bright, it should be gray. Those are the two opposing cartilage surfaces. Large cartilage defect. So she had you know, arthritis of the hip and a, a severe tendonitis bursitis. That was really the pain drivers. We did injections for her with cortisone as diagnostic. All her pain went away. Nothing was coming from the back in this case. Um, and we followed those with PRP. This is another case I thought was interesting. Marathon runner, uh, young lady, very physically fit, uh, was having severe right-sided buttock hip pain, um, had gone to the, uh, even to the level of the neurosurgeon. They were ready to do surgery. She came in. And we, we spoke a little bit and we talked. I did a scan of her hip. Again, I wasn't sure exactly where this was coming from. Very subtly, the origin of the uh, iliotibial band right here was edematous. And it was thickened, barely seen on the MRI. Uh, and it was only because I was pushing on her and I was looking at the imaging at the same time did we figure this out. But this is the origin of the IT band on the asymptomatic left side, this thin band of tissue right here, and then attaching to the bone. And that's the top of it, superficial surface here. That's the bottom of it here. This is the one on the opposite side. Much thicker, much more inflamed. And you can see how large and hypertrophied it was. There's actually a little calcium deposit there. That was the source of her pain. We did an injection into that tissue. She was able to run the marathon that weekend. And so that's uh, another you know, reason to really look at the, the patient, push on them, find out where it's coming from, and don't lump everything into a single group. Why don't we take a five minute break? Sorry, I kept talking. I told you. Five minute break, and then I want to show you some of the regenerative medicine uh, pictures and then a uh, little bit of that. All right. So I got about half an hour, and we'll have people trickle in. But I wanted this is kind of the this is my passion. Um, that other stuff is really cool, but. I've got, really gotten into the regenerative sports medicine injections and therapies, uh, and that's kind of what really drives me at this point, I'm kind of learning more about these. This is another lecture of mine, and uh, just talking about today's pain man management challenges. Uh, increased musculoskeletal care, baby boomers, recreational athletes, we talked about, you know, uh, Northwest, and the, the hiking, the skiing, the running, all the other things, kayaking, that we'll see. Uh, a lot of these injuries, you know, we're uh, limited and the government and society is pushing us to limit narcotic use, which is a good thing because we can get to the diagnosis. Uh, some of the bad things, limitation of physiotherapy visits, and they're not covering. A lot of the coverages don't have alternative and adjunctive care. They don't have any coverage for regenerative medicine injections, so PRP, stem cells. Uh, but they will pay for steroid injections. And some of the insurers now, which is truly frustrating, is when I have a patient coming in with uh, you know, chronic arthritis that's not super inflamed, they're having you know, this chronic pain, they don't have a ton of 
uh, fluid or an effusion, they're making me do a cortisone injection to prove that that's the source of the pain before doing hyaluronic acid. Uh, I'm a pretty big believer in hyaluronic acid. It's paid for by the insurance for mild uh, to moderate arthritis. It works very well. And they're kind of controlling the way that we practice, which is uh, extremely frustrating. Here's my conspiracy theory. Um, so big business is driving government and medicine, obviously. Ortho and spine make their money with implants and surgeries. And the regenerative medicine uh, may cause them to lose revenue. So there's a huge pushback. Uh, the FDA wants to control uh, use of even centrifuges in the office. So they would make using a centrifuge illegal. A physician cannot use a centrifuge. So that would effectively kill all of our regenerative medicine uh, therapies. Uh, steroid injections make patients feel better. Uh, they make the tissues and joints worse over time if overdone. And it's not uncommon that I have patients coming in from uh, clinics that have had seven to 10 uh, cortisone injections in their plantar fascia you know, six, seven injections into their knees or hips with cortisone. Uh, and basically what's happening is they're accelerating that degenerative process and the patients feel wonderful, they trust their physicians, and you know, they're getting uh, the scope soon after because now the cortisone you know, has uh, limited use, uh, diminishing returns. They have more pain and then they get a scope. Uh, and obviously the, the newer literature has shown that meniscectomies for non-mechanical uh, meniscal tears is actually accelerates the progression of arthritis. It's not, it's not beneficial. So going in there and cleaning up stuff is really not the best thing to do unless there's a huge displaced fragment. So, you know, and then what does that lead to? The meniscectomy leads to further acceleration of your arthritis and then you get your knee replacement. So it's really a pretty uh, terrible downward spiral. And so normal, when you guys have seen this, normal wound healing, inflammation, proliferation and remodeling. You remember that slide. And regenerative medicine, uh, so a new paradigm, and we're going to kind of go through this because we don't have too much time. I want to show you the cases. But regenerative medicine covers the worlds of you know, the stem cell, uh, the cellular therapy, the injection therapies, and then this tissue engineering as well. And so this is from Wake Forest University where they're using bioscaffolds uh, and 3D printers to create uh, tissues, implanting them with uh, cellular material and then regrowing you know, artificial uh, limbs, ears, kidneys, organs. Uh, this is pretty amazing stuff they're doing down there. And what we're going to focus on is the injectable therapies, basically harvesting stem cells, growth factors from your body, and then injecting them into uh, tissues. One of the big things that I've seen that has made this uh, much more effective is the diagnostics. So, so using the uh, MRIs, like we spoke of, to find these small partial tears, areas of inflammation, capsular injury. Uh, you saw that partial tear of the origin of the IT band, that's the pain generator. That is the perfect case for platelet-rich plasma because it's a soft tissue, it has some vascularity, it's in an anthesis, a bony attachment. Injecting that area with PRP and providing some physical therapy, that thing's going to heal, right? I mean, it's a, that's a perfect case. So the two things that will help that, number one, the diagnostics because we figured out where it was coming from. Uh, number two is placing that medicine precisely and that's where the ultrasound comes in. So it's the lock and key and we have the two things that go hand in hand together that make this a truly effective therapy. Uh, we see a lot of PRP that's done in the community that's done blindly and the patients come back and they have failures. Um, they, so it hurt worse, you know, they, my pain was down here, they injected my deltoid. Well, you know, likely it was a bursitis or a partial thickness tear of the rotator cuff tear or the rotator cuff and they treated the wrong area. Uh, and it's not pixie dust where you can just kind of throw it in regions and allow it to heal. So this is a picture of the ultrasound, transducer, bursa, underneath their chromium and here's the syringe so you can see uh, ha has anybody here seen ultrasound uh, injections, ultrasound guidance? Can I, uh, let me see a show of hands. Okay, so a few of you. It's very elegant, it's very obvious. Uh, it's, you know, I always say it's kind of like a Mack truck coming down the highway and you can see where you're going. This is a bursa. This is probably, you know, somewhere in the this light of an 18 gauge. It's actually going into the tendon, so this is probably an aggressive PRP type therapy. Uh, the bursa is here. You know, this is probably a millimeter or two thick, and so it's very precise. Um, my personal paradigm shift, so I started doing all of this, you know, seeing the patients, using a lot of uh, cortisone, and the thing that changed me, I started to use PRP about five and a half, six years ago, and we were using it for uh, failure cases, patients that had uh, no benefit with the steroid, soft tissue injury, I wasn't happy at all with what I was getting with partial thickness tears of tendons, and that's where we started with. And 
this was one case that uh, came in a 43 year old school teacher that had a 70% partial thickness tear of her uh, Achilles tendon. So that, again, this is high level three Tesla MRI. This is the Achilles tendon here. It should look more like this all the way through its attachment. This is a tear within the watershed zone, so about four centimeters proximal to the insertion. And that's where we usually get the uh, injuries. The white area is the tear. The dark area is some connecting tissue. So they had about a 70% tear. You can see retracted fibers right there. And this is an ultrasound view of that. That's an, part of the, uh, the tear there. Here is the needle going into that and injecting the PRP. This was uh, over the course of four months, so two PRP injections. They were in a boot for a week, and uh, then back to activity. And you can see here, here's the tear in the sagittal view. Here's in the axial view. So this is looking down the barrel. That's part of the residual tendon, and that's the tear. So we had about a 70% thickness tear. This was two injections over four months. They came back. That tear was completely healed and completely asymptomatic. They actually went on to have their other one treated that was just tendinopathic. It didn't have a tear, but it was hurting, starting to hurt them a little bit. Um, so she was a school teacher, was able to get completely healed before school started again. That was her agenda. And so when I saw that, I ran around the imaging center. When I saw this image here, I ran around and showed all the other radiologists, and I was so excited. And I saw that. I said, this is like, the, this is called the American Buddhist. That was kind of, that was me. <laughs> so a little bit excited. Um, so the PRP preparation, basically, you know, take uh, whole blood from the patient, anywhere between 60, or actually anywhere between 30 and 180 cc's. Uh, right now, we're using FDA-approved kits. Uh, they've been more uh, accurate for us uh, and uh, more, uh, more stable. So we're getting some variable <coughs> platelet counts doing it ourselves right now. So we haven't perfected that technique. Uh, and it can be spending. I want to make sure that the patients are getting what they're paying for. Uh, we're able to extract the platelet-rich layer, the buffy coat, and inject it back into areas. So pretty simple process. Uh, it affects wound healing, so basically, it's per, when we talk about a, an injury, and a chronic injury, like a tendon injury, it gets stuck in this chronic inflammatory state. It just can't get to the proliferative and uh, remodeling phases. So what we do is we're able to affect the change at this level by re-energizing that tissue. You're putting in all these growth and healing factors into that tissue <clears throat> and allowing it to, to progress. A thing that goes hand in hand with that, and I've spoken about this multiple times, is the physiotherapy or physical therapy. And especially with tendons, if you have a hole in that tendon, you're putting all this tissue or this regenerative capacity in the tendon, you need stress on that. Just like when uh, folks work out, you're tearing your muscles so it gets stronger. You need that stress on the tissues. You need the uh, expression of that uh, force in that vector, and then the tissues will start to align. You'll get that nice type 1 collagen to rebuild, and so that's really important. <clears throat> Without that, people may get better, but I've seen it uh, be much less effective. Patients that say, I've had physical therapy. I'm not going to do that again. And I used to kind of fall for that line, but I'm pretty rigorous at this point. Um, we use it for joints, tendons, ligaments, muscle tears. So when we started doing this, you know, the main thing was, is it safe? We talked about that in the beginning. What's the safety profile? <clears throat> it's been used for over 30 years in orthodont uh, orthodontia uh, and in equestrian we're in uh, veterinary medicine. They're much more advanced than us. They've been using uh, stem cells, seeing very good results, and there's no placebo effect. That horse is going to run or it's not going to run. It's going to be uh, hurt or fixed. And so the PRP to me was the pl uh, gateway drug. So I like this. I like cartoons. I like this cartoon. Um, so this is basically the kind of entry level, I thought, too, and maybe prolotherapy precedes this, but uh, the entry level to these things, this regenerative medicine realm. Uh, so now what we've been doing more and more of are the stem cells, and I'll just kind of explain the difference, but these are unspecialized replicable cells that live in our uh, body in various tissues. You have small amounts in your bloodstream, uh, you have it in your more proliferative amounts, or more prolific amounts in your bone marrow, uh, and in your fat. And in the fat especially, it uh, stays pretty st uh, stable levels throughout life. Uh, there are pericytes in the fat that can convert into stem cells, and so those are, can be very effective. As we age, you know, somewhere around uh, 35 and older, unfortunately, our bone marrow supply starts to diminish quite dramatically. And then when we hit 60s and 70s, there's pretty small amounts. Now, the bone marrow can be very effective. It has tons of platelets, probably 10 times the amount that you get in your uh, bloodstream, uh, concentration-wise. So it can be an effective uh, PRP. But as you get older, it may not be the best thing for the stem cells. And so we're using, you know, autologous uh, human uh, mesenchymal stem cells from the patient. So where do we use the different ones? For PRP, you know, I consider it like a, 
if you're, you have a broken wall, the bricks are all together, the wall's kind of falling apart, and you need the, the spackle uh, or the things to put it together again, that's what the PRP is. It's that growth factor, right? If, if you need something more robust, if the tissue's de more degenerative, if the tear's larger, if it's a labral tear or a meniscal tear or something that needs a more robust response and a, you need a cellular material there, then I've noticed that the bone marrow or fat-derived stem cells seem to work a lot better. Um, the other thing that we have used in the past and use it uh, sparingly at this point is amniotic membrane. So the amnion and the chorion, uh, this has been used FDA approved for trigium, a condition of the eye. They use little flaps of this and also wound healing, it's FDA approved. Uh, what they have done for sports medicine is they've taken this amnion and chorion and uh, broken it down into small particles, uh, particulate matter, and you can reconstitute it with saline and inject it just like a PRP. It's chock full of growth factors, uh, metalloprotease inhibitors, and things that help with reduction in inflammation and healing. Um, the other nice thing is that it's non-immunogenic. There's no HLA antigens on the chorion and the amnion, so we don't have that uh, you know, uh, host response to that. It does cause a more robust inflammatory response. Patients complain of it hurting more. And so <clears throat> what I'm going to go into now is some case studies, really focusing on ligaments and tendon injury because they're easy to image. Uh, this is the concept that I want you to think about as far as uh, ligament and tendon injury. This is your natural uh, tendon or ligament, right? and this is when it starts to break down and become tendinopathic. So you lose that structure. You get those frayed edges. You get those. Uh, and if it's acutely inflamed, you can get inflammatory mediators in the area. Uh, this was one study that I thought was very powerful, and it has gotten very little press. They did an abstract, and for some reason they didn't publish it. Uh, but I thought it was a very simple and interesting study. There was a 204 patients, these are orthopedic surgeons, 204 patients, 50-50 split with partial thickness rotator cuff tears, uh, MR diagnosed. And they did uh, simple intraversal injections. They didn't go and try to perforate uh, or do a tenotomy with the tissues. They just did a bursal injection. Went half the group, 102 patients, with steroid, half with PRP. <clears throat> this one, best poster at AOS 2013. So three months later after the injections, the PRP was statistically uh, better than the cortisone injections. Patients were doing better. This was profound, though. One year after the injections, three patients in the PRP cohort had undergone surgery for recalcitrant pain. Three. Uh, less than 3%, 48 in the corticosteroid group had gone to surgery for uh, recalcitrant pain. So you can see the difference. Think about that. You saved 45 surgeries in 204 patients. Right? That's amazing to, to see that. So this is a, a huge implication on the cost to society. Think about all these surgeries that are done. You know, the studies are coming out uh, every day showing that we can't afford it. I mean, this, our uh, country simply can't afford that. The other thing is the systemic effects, and we're seeing this too, also with the stem cell therapies. This is Amy Washerlane out of Stanford. Um, she showed that uh, with localized injections of PRP, they were, this was an activating uh, source for biologic pathways. It was so much so that some of these uh, IGF-1, VEGF, beta FGF were elevated in the bloodstream that would trigger uh, positive results on the WADA testing. Okay, so it's interesting that a local injection is going to create uh, or stimulate synthetic pathways. And so that's what we're seeing, and even more so with the, the stem cells. And they've shown some of those similar studies with stem cells for cardiac disease, where a year or two years later, they're seeing increased stem cell load in the uh, peripheral bloodstream. And so other areas of injury are healing better. Uh, this was a case of calcific tendonitis, 42-year-old drummer. And he had had uh, six months of shoulder pain, recalcitrant to physiotherapy. He came in, he had this large calcium deposit. This is this black thing here, and it's surrounded by fluid and edema. This is a sagittal view of the shoulder. So humeral head, right, glenoid, a chromium, and the rotator cuff coming through here. So you have this big calcium deposit, but the rotator cuff, this should also be nice and dark. You see these lines here, the white lines? That's fluid imbibing into the structure of the tendon and uh, demonstrating that it's injured. It's kind of just a, I call this like a gamush and it's not very healthy, right? You can see this. This was after two washes. We do a calcific tendonitis lavage aspiration, and so we washed as much of the calcium out as we could, but the tendon was still not very healthy. The patient had about 30% reduction in pain. That kind of, the inf inflammation pain had gone away, but the chronic tendinopathy hadn't. And then we did the amniotic membrane injections with ultrasound, and you can see over the course of a few months, this irritated, angry-looking tendon, like that other rope, had suddenly started to reform, and here you can see 
this really nice, normal looking tendon. Okay? And that's the body's ability to heal. <clears throat> this is a little larger example of that. You can see this picture where it's irregular, partial thickness tears. And here, that same area, very confluent, very organized. So think of that rope example. All right. Another one, uh, partial thickness tear patellar tendon. So a lot of these are younger patients. This was uh, several months old, they had a basketball injury, and we're looking down the barrel of the uh, patellar tendon. You can see this bright area. So a little partial thickness tear, it should look like this, dark all the way down. Uh, so number one is finding the problem. Not everything as they come in with knee pain is arthritis, right? So these soft tissue injuries are very prominent. Here is the, the tear. This is the ultrasound of that same area. This is the inferior patella. This is the tendon, and see these fibers right here? That's that type one collagen. We call that a fibrillar pattern uh, on ultrasound. So very taut, uh, well-organized uh, type one collagen. And you can see here, you lose that, right? It becomes irregular. Uh, it was interesting, we put this you know, 25 gauge needle into this area, injected the PRP, and you can see that it's well demarcated where the PRP is going, right? You have this soft tendon, it's kind of a, uh, not a very healthy uh, tissue, and you inject this, and it fills that, this healthier tissue where there's uh, taut type 1 fibers, it's not accepting that. So we injected that area, this was five weeks after, uh, and you can see it start to fill in right in that area, you about 95% reduction in pain, and you can see it's almost normal, right in here. The other thing that's interesting is that effusion that the patient had, they had a little bit of joint fluid, that's also resolved, so it's having some localized regional effects. This is a patient, a, um, he was uh, an employee of the city, a uh, forest ranger from Multnomah County, and they were cutting down some trees, he had an acute injury, and had this uh, partial thickness tear of the common extensor tendon. So you can see this a ton, right? Uh, tennis elbow, or this was a little bit more severe, he had a partial thickness tear. And they gave him a cortisone injection in the clinic without guidance, he didn't have any benefit. Came to see us, they had done the MRI. He was on uh, <coughs> leave because he couldn't work, he had severe pain. I asked them to do PRP, they wouldn't pay for it, so we did a cortisone injection with guidance. And he felt quite a bit better. He came back four months later, and he had worse pain than he started off with. Not an uncommon story with cortisone. The tear looked similar, if not slightly larger. <clears throat> and so we told him about this, and we had the amniotic membrane at that time, so I did it for free for him. But we did this injection, and you can see the tear here on ultrasound, here that triangular structure, and you can see the dark area right there. So this is like a millimeter and a half, two millimeter tear. It was a very small tear, so you have to be very specific about where you're going. This is the needle, and we placed the injectate right into that area. He came back six weeks later, had about 80% pain relief, had plateaued, getting better, and we had all of this edema, and it actually looked worse, because it's brighter, it looks like it's thicker, so I was worried. I said, are you really having pain relief? And he said, no, it feels great, but I have, you know, it's not, I'm just not there yet, I'm working, but it's still giving me a little pain at night and some other issues. and so. What I realized later on was that even though it looked worse, it was much more edematous, the con uh, conspicuity of this tear had greatly diminished. So it's just less, less obvious. And what was happening, this is that proliferative phase. It may have taken him longer, but he's still in that building phase. He's all that cellular material in that area. And then a year later, he came back. This was after the second one. And you can see it's completely normal. And so that was the, so I went through every slice because people said, is that the right slice? I just want to show. So looking at here, you know, this is the pre, this is the post with steroid where it's actually maybe uh, elongating with the tear and here is the, the post. And you know, if we see him back, if he keeps up his exercises and things, this is probably even going to look more organized and better uh, later. This is a 46 year old decathlete, jumper's knee. This was an 18 month old injury. So these are chronic injuries that are coming to us. They had a, a little avulsion of his, uh, that is a patellar tendon origin. This is a piece of bone right here. This is uh, you know, edema surrounding that. He could not walk upstairs. He was heading right after he saw me to the um, uh, psychologist or psychiatrist's office to start uh, antidepressants because he's so depressed. This guy was number two in the country uh, in senior level, extremely fit, extremely active, could not walk upstairs without pain, uh, and was really seeking some help. He had seen a couple, seen a couple of orthopedic surgeons that were gonna, ready to do surgery had had one cortisone injection without benefit. Here's that little piece of avulsed bone, and there's the tear. Uh, here is the area. So here's the kind of the correlate. This is the patient lying flat. There's the patella, right? There's the tendon. And you can see the nice organized tendon fibers right here that demarcates the superficial margin of the tendon, inferior border. And all of this is just irregular tissue. This is the avulsed piece of bone that's shadowing. 
that came off of here. So this is the needle placing that PRP. It took me almost a year to get him completely better, um, and it was a progression uh, through that time. So we gave him our first injection six weeks later, no pain with stairs. Started running him, had pain. Brought him back, did another PRP. He could run, jog without pain. Sprinting, he had pain. Injected him again, he could sprint. And then finally it was ballistic. So it took us a long time, a lot of rehab. But he was making zero gain prior to that with any other regimen. And this is uh, the before and after. And he won the national championships the following year. So it took me a year to get better. And then in 2012, he won the, the title again. So he did extremely well um, for that and was uh, very pleased. This was a two-year-old um, injury, 37-year-old female, again, similar. Uh, patellar, or patellar tendon origin, dashboard injury. This is a good case. This patient had an um, uh, open scan MR, and they said normal knee. They didn't pick up this area of uh, edema or injury, the split tear. She had hit the dashboard right there. Uh, they said nothing's wrong with your knee. She was on disability on narcotics uh, at this time. And so she came in to see us, was really frustrated. Uh, we did a three Tesla MR, found this, and it fit with her physical examination finding as well. One PRP, six weeks later, she came back. Complete resolution of her tear and all of the edema around it. You can see all of the inflammation. The bright here is you know, bad. Here is the, the normal tendon. It looks like this one here. You can see that's fixed. That linear tear is gone, and she had complete resolution. She came back six months later, had lost 35 pounds, brought us a bunch of you know, presents, and was extremely happy. This was a flight attendant, common extensor tendon. She was on disability as well. Uh, I forget how old this injury was, but she could not work at all. Severe partial thickness tear of the common extensor tendon. So this is a radial head, a lateral epicondyle at the elbow. Right? And all of that, there should be nice dark tendon filling in all of this. It was bright. And then you can see this huge joint effusion. So she probably had some radiocollateral ligament issue as well and instability. And you can see how inflamed and angry this was. Is, is there a question? I do not. No, I don't. They may have it in that, uh, that article, but I'm not sure if th how far out they, they followed it. <coughs> but I can give you the, that particular article if you need. We have that on file. Um, the question was how long uh, VEGF and uh, beta-FGF were elevated after uh, PRP injections. The, again, this was patient six weeks later, one injection, and you can see the uh, resolution of this tear. She had new neotendon. Uh, created there, and here's the axial view here. All of the edema, the instability, all those issues had gone away. And so that was one treatment, some physical therapy, and now we're treating her knee uh, three or four years later uh, for an injury, and this is still resolved. So this was a curative uh, therapy. Par uh, full thickness rotator cuff tear. This is actually one of our employees' husbands. Uh, a laborer, works in a warehouse, pretty active uh, gentleman, very fit, and had a full thickness rotator cuff tear. He came to me with this, and I said, you've got to go to the surgeon. You know, I don't think this is going to work. He refused. So we tried the PRP. Now, this was the ultrasound of the, the tendon, full thickness tear right here. This is what a normal tendon should look like. This is the, the humeral head, right? greater tuberosity, a normal tendon, a thin bursa overlying it, deltoid and fat. So you can see that here, there's a large defect. We call this a sagging bursal sign. So you can see that there's nothing here to hold up the bursa. Here it's convex. Here it's concave. Uh, here's the needle, putting the PRP into that area. This is ultrasound follow-up uh, five months later and one year later of this defect. This is the proliferative phase uh, and healing, and then this is finally actually neotendon coming. It's not perfect looking, but he had no pain, so we weren't going to go back in there. Uh, this is a one-year follow-up, two PRPs later. You can see there's the full thickness tear. This is kind of that proliferative phase with some material developing in there. He had dramatic reduction of pain, but it didn't look that much better. And then this was a year later, we actually had neotendon attaching, and he has, this is several years out as well. A sports hernia, uh, kind of a misnomer, but adductor rectus abdominis aponeurotic plate injury, core muscle injury, uh, very common in soccer players, young athletes, football players, cutting athletes, and they have severe groin pain. Not everything is a labral tear, so be careful. So if it's groin pain, physical examination, uh, resisted adduction is very painful. Uh, when they start uh, running or cutting, they'll have pain, and if they take a break, the pain seems to go away. But whenever they reinitiate athletics, it'll start again. But you see here, this is the tendon attachment to the pubic symphysis, and there's a partial thickness tendon tear. Uh, there's also this stripping of the periosteum. And PRP is not generally recognized as a therapy for this. We do cortisone injections, 
uh, for these soccer players. And this, the surgery that they have for this is awful. Uh, we see patients come back, and when it doesn't work, it's a disaster. It's, it's truly not the very effective surgery. There's a few centers around the country that are purporting this. We've sent patients out to that, and they just haven't had good results. We've started doing PRP, and almost every single patient that we've uh, treated has gotten better. Uh, I think everyone that we've treated that had this particular process has with PRP, and it's ultrasound guided, you put it in the right spot, and they seem to do very well. But here's the tear. Again, bright is bad, tear is right there, and that's where the uh, adductors come in, and here you can see the uh, rectus insertion at the front of the pubic symphysis. Here's that stripping of the periosteum, which can be very painful. This is uh, two PRPs later. Patient could do no athletic activities before, is now skiing, soccer, everything like that. You can see the tendon is healing in, and that periosteal stripping is completely gone. And this is another last one, and we're out of time. But this is exciting. We're starting to have another case that's not on here. But this is a herniated disc. Um, and this was the herniated disc initially. This patient came in, and there it's pressing on the nerve root. The nerve roots here are getting squashed, uh, you know, right and left. This is S1, and this is S1 here. They came in knowing that they wanted epidural PRP. I was a little bit apprehensive. This was a couple years ago. I didn't, hadn't done that before. Uh, he had not had any injections. He had a couple of cortisone injections. He had no benefit. And he told me, you know, you promised me you'd do this. So we, uh, you know, I talked to several colleagues. And we do epidural blood patches all the time. Um, and so we said, okay, we can, we'll do this. I did the injection, PRP. Uh, and this was a standard PRP with RBCs and it's somewhat semi-inflammatory. And he called back seven days later, complete resolution of his sciatic pain. He had some low back pain that was persistent. And we went back and I told him, come in, I want to scan you again. Uh, we scanned him again, and you could see that the disc was about half the size. We did a couple more treatments. That's the disc, here's the nerve. And he had complete resolution, and this was permanent. He didn't have uh, a re-exacerbation of his sciatic symptoms. Uh, he continued to have some low back pain, but it was pretty profound. And we've uh, been treating more and more patients with uh, epidural PRP, and now we're uh, going into the realm of interdiscal uh, stem cells, bone marrow, uh, and fat. And we're seeing some pretty amazing results. We've just started to, to re-image. We have a couple of cases. But uh, that's, that's it. Thank you very much.